you. Turn with me again to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 1. God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Yesterday we looked at verses 1 through 3, seeing that Jesus is the full manifestation of the Father. Now the book goes to establishing his superiority over everything. And while you and I postulate that, we just accept that, they didn't remember to whom this person is writing. Persons in Judaism who have embraced the grace of Jesus, but trying to make it fit the old patterns. Have you ever noticed how we tend to that? Every fresh move of God gets dragged back into prior moves of God, and we try to define what God is saying in harmony with what God has said, or what God is doing with what God did. As though God is so limited, he repeats himself every few generations. But he need not. God assumes that we learned what he taught. Now, based upon that knowledge comes more communication, further truth, and further truth. But when we drag the higher revelation down to the lower revelations, we never come into the fullness of truth. So this writer is trying to communicate to them, don't take Jesus back into the Judaism system. Let Jesus bring you up into something higher. But is graciously trying to uh, appreciate what is right. The second danger is when a new thing comes is to throw out all the old. And I saw that happen so in the charismatic move, and I remember when it was happening in the Pentecostal move. I'm that old. That when there came a fresh move of God, we despised everything that we've been involved in. Because ritual had become so cold, we threw out everything that had to do with that. And God doesn't throw out anything that he did. He builds on it. And most of the error, if not all of the error, that I have seen in the charismatic move would have been prevented if they'd been willing to look at church history. Nothing new in the way of error came up. It had all been tested and proved and thrown out years ago. But when you throw out all of the background, then you have to start over again. We reinvented the wheel and we left out some spokes. So here the goal was to say, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to start over. All that God gave in Judaism was great. What we did with what he gave isn't so great. But his gift was great. But now he's given us something superior, something greater. Jesus is greater than. I pointed out to you that the book starts as no other book in the Bible. God. Are you aware with me that scripture never proves the being of God? Over and over again, I'll have persons approach me, usually younger persons, fresh in the Lord, and notebook poised. They say, Brother Cornell, I know this is an old question you've been asking you an awful lot, but you sure save me a lot of time. If, if you just give me a couple of verses that proves that there's a God. Well, I said, there are no such verses. Oh, surely the Bible would prove there's a God. I said, no, no. The scripture never proves the being of God. It assumes the being of God. And it deals with people who assume the being of God. I have not found it necessary to prove that I am. The very fact that there is a book that I wrote should establish that I am. God wrote us a book. He's the author. That's the beginning of God's assumption. If he can write, if he can speak, then he is. Don't waste too much of your time in concordance trying to find proof text that there's a God. God doesn't need to prove his existence. He is. As a matter of fact, God is and God only is. So no, I am too. In him we live and move and have our being. If God is not, we are not. Everything we know in life comes out of God, is evidence of God, is manifestation of God. 
my wife repeatedly says, you could never disclaim your daughters. It's obvious you are their father. They look like you, they walk like you, they act like you. I'm not sure she means that complimentarily, but it's true. They prove my existence. And you and I are the evidence that God has chosen to give to the world that there is a God. Now, this God who is, this God who only is, can be known. Man can know God. That's why this book can just start out. God. God who? Oh, there's only one God. Well, what about that God? <clears throat> Let's not worry about that. God. We can know God, but we can only know him in part. Anyone who claims I know all there is to know about God is lying, probably out of stupidity. We don't know everything there is to know about one another. I once made some stupid little remark about really knowing my wife. And she looked at me and she said, Judson, you don't know me. I can read you like a book, but if I ever catch you reading me, I'll change. <laughs> she said, it's that mess, it is that mistake that keeps you related to me. We don't know each other fully, much less know God fully. <clears throat> Man can know God, but we cannot know him perfectly. Man's power of apprehending God is totally adequate to our moral nature. That is to say, everything you need to know about God for morality is revealed. But we can't know God sufficiently to satisfy our mental necessities. We always want to know more. On several occasions in my life, I have known the fullness of God, only to discover that that was just a little bit fuller than what I had known. For every level of revelation God gives opens up a whole new realm of unknown to where I now know less of God than I knew when I started seeking him 60 some odd years ago. To me, that's the joy. You'll never exhaust God. You never come to know all there is to know about God. And when I see persons who are stale in their relationship with God and have allowed God to become commonplace to them, I have a sense that perhaps they know more about doctrine than they know about God. I think if you give yourself to it, you, you can learn doctrine. You can just about get it all down. But not God. Because God is not doctrine. Sometimes he's not even in our doctrine. God is God, will always be God. He is person, and he is so much greater than we can ever conceive of him. It's quite a saw in the state side for young people to be quoted as saying, I'm amazed at how much my father learned between my 16th and 18th birthday. I think you might be amazed how much smarter God gets as you get more mature. Because first we know God is a need meter. And then when basic needs have been met and we've come into a comfortable walk of faith, we begin to know him in other realms, in higher realms, a more glorious realm. So man cannot know God perfectly, but we can know him sufficiently. Now remember, the theme of Hebrews is Jesus is better than the prophets, the angels, Moses, covenants, you name it, he's better than. This passage we've read this morning tells me three things about our Jesus. It tells me that God is a speaking God. For it declares God spoke to the fathers. I have on occasion had pastors speak to me graciously and say, Brother Cornwall, you're confusing my people, and frankly, I'm just a little confused myself. You, you just speak so offhandedly when God spoke, and God said, and God directed, and God said. Uh, Brother Cornwall, I don't hear from God. God doesn't speak to me. You no, know, that is not true. You may not hear from God, but God does speak to you, because God is a speaking God. It's part of his very nature. God spoke. 
repeatedly, remember, the Old Testament contrasts Jehovah with idolatry or idols. And in the contrast, he speaks of the idol's inability to speak. Psalm 135, 17 is indicative of that. Speaking of the idols, they have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouth. And to Judah and Israel, God spoke to the prophets, Hey, those idols to Baal and Ashtoreth, have they ever spoken? Have you ever heard them say anything? But you've heard my voice. I've spoken. I've directed. I've guided. It is imperative that we be aware that God speaks. I've had some say, well, yes, you know, I know God spoke. But that's in the past. God doesn't speak today. I have news for you. The only time God does speak is today. Because he has no past. He has no future. He lives in the eternal now. We creatures of time divide units in past, present, future. With God, it's all one eternal now. If God ever spoke, he speaks. If God ever did, he does. God changes not. So let's not get so dispensational that there was a season when God spoke, but now we know everything God wants to teach, and so God is silent. No. No, we're slow learners. Plus, about the time we really know something, they bury us. And that's very discouraging to me because I'm still alive. If I really knew something, they'd bury me. My point is, as we mature, we also age. We go off the scene about the time we really find something coming from God, and now here's a whole new generation coming. They need to hear from God. There's a church in Rochester, New York, that I've been involved with for the last 30 years. From the days they laid the foundation of the building right on through, I was the dedicatory speaker, etc. But for a season, I was not involved with them. There's some changes and upheavals, and you know how it is. New pastors come in, and they don't remember who the other speakers were. Now the former pastor's wife, because the pastor's off the scene, is the pastor. She asked if I would come. I did. Seated on the platform looking out, I knew virtually no one in the building. It had probably been 10 years since I'd been there. She said, do you recognize anyone? I said, well, a few of the old timers. No, it's, it's a new congregation. She says, the tragedy is that although we are a charismatic church, none of these people out here have ever seen a move of God. They know nothing about the charismatic move. They've come in and embraced our teaching. They've learned our language. They've adopted our methods, but they've never seen our God. She says, please don't speak to them as old seasoned saints. Talk to them like you used to talk to the early charismatics. Introduce them to foundational principles. And I thanked her for that, and I have found that so many of the churches I'm visiting have grown, and they have new persons in who know not God. Saved, yes, I accept that they know the works of God, but God they don't know. And so we need to reintroduce our people to the fact God is a speaking God. Jesus, I'm sorry, the, the prophet was quickened to speak for God in Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. When persons ask me, when do you hear from God? I say, when I'm talking to him. Oh, what do you mean? It's in my prayer time. What I've closeted myself to have communication with God that sometimes we shift from monologue to dialogue. And that's when he speaks. Some years ago, the leaders of the charismatic move cloistered themselves together in a Catholic retreat center for a solid week to interact with one another. We had done that for several years. On this occasion, one of the brethren stood with a prophetic word that a new move of God, quite different from the charismatic, was coming, and that he would like to have those who were leaders in the charismatic move to be involved in the transition to the next move, and perhaps participants, but that we would have to seek his face to find out what it was all about. 
So the director said, well, it sure seems to be God. And all of us confirm, yes, in our spirit, we feel that's God. He said, well, um, what shall we do? Um, well, let's all have a word of prayer. So we went around the circle. Each person prayed a two-minute prayer. We got through. It didn't seem that we'd heard anything from God. So they had us number off. One, two, one, two, one, two. All the ones, the one, two, got together. I didn't put it correctly. Paired us. These pair, you go out that direction, you go that direction. And for an hour, just get acquainted with each other. And then come back and tell us what you've learned. Well, what I learned was all about the fellow, not God. Or what God was saying. So their third move was to divide us in groups of six. Group number one here, two, three, four, five, six. And, and, and let's just talk and find out what God is saying. Well, I found myself in a group of the biggies in the world movement. And I felt rather low. You know, I'm just a little Pentecostal kid. So I just kept my mouth shut as they began talking. What's God saying? What's God saying? And none of them would admit to hearing anything from God. So finally, one of them pointed his finger and said, well, Judson, what's God saying to you? So I just blabbed out what I was hearing from God. When I finished, he says, that's amazing. You actually hear that from God? I said, yes. Well, when do you hear from God? He said, when I'm in prayer. Well, how much time do you spend praying? I said, well, three hours a day. Whew! I said, well, sir, how much time do you spend praying? Oh, he said, I don't pray. That's my wife's responsibility. She prays. I said, Jen, would you mind if I would poll you? And I went down the list. The maximum time that any of the leaders would admit to, if I would include praying over the meals, was 10 minutes a day. And I said, brothers, no wonder we're not hearing from God. If our time is so filled with activity, What's God going to do? Speak to us at a stoplight? God is a speaking God. And he'd like to have a listening people. But it's if you call, I will answer and show. The initiative is ours, not God's. God doesn't go, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I'll speak to you, to you, no. Eeny, me. In saying, in times past, God spoke to our fathers. It's telling me that Jehovah is a self-revealing God. God cannot be discovered. He must reveal himself. They've never found God in a test tube. Our most astute scientists have not discovered God. We've not discovered him in the computers. Our astronauts have found him, not found him in outer space. You don't discover God. He must reveal himself. Now, man has always gone astray when he has tried to know what God is essentially and absolutely. For I think a person would have to be God to know God essentially and absolutely. A person can only know God through relationship with him. Now, all through the scripture, our relationship with God is illustrated with the marriage relationship. All ten major Bible divisions speak of that, that relationship of marriage, husband, wife, illustrative of what we have in God. We were attracted to one another and stood to take our vows with an inner feeling, I know this woman. I know this man. My wife and I courted in our freshman year of Bible schools. Totally against the rules. I guess that made it even more exciting. But we got by with it. She's a farm girl. She wrote home to her father about this wonderful young man she was in love with. And said, Dad, I'm going to marry him. Uh, I know him as I've never known anyone on the face of the earth. And then she began to tell him what she knew about him. My hat size, my shoe size, my shirt size, and some of my dreams. He may have just been a farmer, but he was a wise old man. He wrote back to her and said, Daughter, you don't know Judson Cornwall. But go ahead and marry him. You deserve it. 
But after you've lived with him 20 years, come and tell me what you know about Judson Cornwall. When we first meet God, we say, oh, I know God, I know God, he's so wonderful. Oh, really, we don't. You've got to live with him a while. It's one thing to preach on grace, it's another thing to know grace. It's out of experience with God that we come to know God. And I don't know any other way to know God than through relationship with him. The limit of man's knowledge of God is God's revelation of himself. For instance, Moses at the burning bush. Mm, quite a story. He's been out of ministry for years on the backside of the desert because he had done a no-no and ran for his life. I think murder is a no-no, isn't it? even in today's denominations. The bush burn, he was curious, he went, a voice spoke to him, take off your shoes. He's so overawed with this communication of an angel to him, that when he is told to go tell Pharaoh, from whom Moses is hiding, you know, let my people go. Now that would be somewhat equivalent of the Lord telling you to go to the top official of your land and say, God says turn off all of Canada's electricity and destroy her automobiles. Because that would not paralyze Canada any more than the loss of the Hebrew slaves paralyzed Egypt. This was their entire, entire labor force. To me, the amazing part is Moses bought into this. Starts out, and then he starts, oh, uh, excuse me, sir. <clears throat> Whom shall I say has sent me? I think they may ask. And God's answer is almost a rebuke. All God said is, I am that I am. I am being. That's all you can know about me, Moses. What that I am, you can know. What I am to you, you can know. What I have been to your forefathers, you can know. But there's no way I can explain who I am totally. I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Check up what I became to them. Learn from that revelation, because I'm not going to repeat myself. I am something else to you. I will be something else to Joshua. None of the fresh revelations will violate the previous, but when you put them all together, you still don't have a good concept of who I am. Say, well, Adam, Adam knew God. Well, the scripture seems to teach quite clearly that Adam fellowshiped the voice of God. It was the voice of God that came to Abraham, to Noah, to Moses. It's not that God was super selective whom he would reveal himself or to whom he would communicate. I think God was talking, but few were listening. There's such a long span from the story of Noah to the days of Abraham. Dare we assume that during these hundreds of years God didn't talk to anybody? Or is it not more likely God was talking and nobody was tuned in? When people say, well, I never hear from God, I say, well, try changing channels. God broadcasts on channel three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you're listening to channel 13, you're not going to hear anything from God. Does it seem as peculiar to you as it does to me that the book of Hebrews is totally silent about God's communication and revelation in nature and in conscience? Paul makes a big deal of that in Romans 1 and 2. God speaking through nature and how it reveals God. That, that's one of the arguments for this not being a Pauline epistle. 
uh, why doesn't Paul stay consistent with the way he taught the revelation of God? Why doesn't this writer, whoever he or she may be, bring that in? Well, probably because of sin, we've lost the key to the language of creation. We no longer hear God in it. Oh, we know that he speaks in creation and in conscience, for the book of Romans says so, but while we may feel God in the grandeur of revelation, I mean, of, of nature, we don't hear God. I took my wife to see the Grand Canyon the first time four or five years ago. We stood at the rim looking down at that great cavern, and you couldn't help but be overwhelmed with the majesty of it all. And I had my camcorder on, and the man next to me talked to his children and began to extol God, the Creator, and how magnificent this was. Thrilled me. I kept on just to record what he was saying. But while in generalities we could say, oh, this is the work of God, we didn't hear God. Two years ago, I took that eight-day raft trip down the Grand Canyon. My wife didn't expect me to come out alive and uh, wanted me to go have my mind checked for sanity. But I've never seen such grandeur, such beauty, or had a greater awareness of God, but none of the 60-some-out who were on the two rafts seemed to see what I was seeing or feel what I was feeling. But frankly, I wasn't hearing. I was just seeing. So nature can overwhelm you with a sense of his grandeur and majesty, but sin has closed our ears to hearing it talk to us. I'm even more amazed that this person writing to the Hebrews, worshiping in Judaism, fails to speak of God in the Mosaic area of Revelation. Because I have in times past been very taken with the Tabernacle of Moses. Used to teach it widely, wrote my second book on it, did very, very well. By the way, the first six books, seven books that I wrote have been out of print for eight years. They're back in print now, so they will be available to you. Uh, I love the tabernacle. It shows Jesus in its dimensions, in its material, in its worksmanship, in its utilization, in its placement of all the items of worship. It's a glorious revelation of Jesus. Why doesn't this person writing to people who are involved in that sort of worship, why doesn't this person say, hey, God's talking to you through the lampstand. God's talking to you through the altar of incense. God's speaking to you through the outside curtains. No. The author says nothing about rites, rituals, institutions, or law, because probably he or she wanted to compare Christ to the highest, not that, that which man had degraded to form, works, ceremony. Will you remember with me hearing speakers in our charismatic conferences, spirit-filled brothers and sisters from the Lutheran faith, some of the other groups that were very ritualistic, formal, historic, and they say, you know, for years I've performed this ritual. Meaningless, empty. Didn't even have it in my mind while we're doing it. And now that I'm filled with the Spirit, it's rich, it's marvelous, it's full of meaning. How could I have been so blind? Well, we are. We're blind to the spiritual principles behind our religious practice. So instead of trying to take the religious practice and say, this is pictures Jesus just totally ignores it and goes for a higher revelation and says God speaks would it also make sense to you that stating God spoke to our fathers that it not only affirms that God is a speaking God and God is a self-revealing God but that man is capable of receiving communication from God God spoke to our fathers. Not just spoke creation into being. He spoke to our fathers. They got it. We people can understand, appreciate, appropriate the thought of God concerning himself. As a matter of fact, more than we can, we are under obligation to do so. 
Have you ever thought that perhaps prayer is the echo in your own spirit of the voice of God? How do you learn to speak? By listening to speech. Frankly, if I really knew how we did it, I'd be a wealthy man because they've been studying that for years and they just don't quite put together how this infant is able to master this marvelous thing called communication. But it's done by mimicry. It's done by hearing and performing. And they pick it up the way mama talks, the way daddy talks. How will we learn to speak to God? By saying back to God what he has said to us. I don't know if I had any of the books on the table up there, but I wrote a book at the request of my publisher, Creation House. That's the house I was trying to remember last night, sister. They, they phoned me and asked me, would you consider writing a book on praying the scriptures? We've searched the Catholic literature, they have it. We've searched the evangelical literature, they have it. But the Pentecostal charismatic literature has nothing on it. So we wrote the book, Praying the Scriptures. And the premise of the book is, God's word is God's voice. Anytime we say back to God what he said to us, we're on safe territory. And that we will learn to speak to God by saying what God spoke to us. For some season, from eight to nine in my church, because my prayer time started at nine, I would walk up and down my center aisle that was 80 feet long with a Bible open, and I would read a psalm, a verse at a time, while I was walking, because I wanted to get my exercise in at the same time I was beginning spiritual. I'd read the verse, and then I'd say, if I could identify with it, me too and go to the next verse. But if I couldn't, I say, Lord, I didn't say that. Because, you know, those psalms say some things I don't have the nerve to say to God. At least I didn't then. They say, David said that, and uh, <clears throat> he got by with it. I don't know how to identify with that, but this is your word. Then I go to the next verse. And for an hour a day, I would just take a portion of the word, sometimes never get beyond two or three verses, sometimes a full psalm, and just walk and read it to God and say, Lord, help me to identify with this. Help me to get hold of this. Help me to appreciate this. Help me to get it beyond my brain, down to my spirit, until I can pray what Asaph is praying, until I can say what David is saying. Help me, Lord, to get involved with the message the sons of Korah had. I learned to praise doing that. I learned to talk to God by using his word. What I heard by reading, I said back to him. God speaks first. Prayer answers as well as asks. While it is true that we can initiate prayer and have the responsibility to do so, that prayer is a discipline, it's also true that the best prayer is initiated by God. And I don't know what you've observed, but I noticed that, that God often doesn't come at convenient times. There are times I have the computer up, I'm working on a chapter, I'm just deeply involved, and I'm tapped on the shoulder, as it were, and God wants to talk. And, and, and I'll turn to him and say, don't bother me right now. Tap me again. Where were you at 8 o'clock? I prayed from 8 to 9, and you weren't here at all. I'm busy. And he withdraws. And I'll spend the next five hours trying to get my five pages a day that I set for myself as a minimum written. But if I'll drop what I'm doing and say, oh, Lord, I missed you a little earlier, and just talk with him, no matter how much time he takes, when I go back to my writing, it flows. Instead of five pages, I'll get ten pages, and it flows from deep within. It's never time lost to interrupt what you're doing to talk to God because it will always be instructive, inspirational, directive, and he will also compensate for anything that you've lost. Prayer often is just a response to his voice. Learn to say back what he's saying in you. I seem to puzzle some of you, like I'm not quite getting through to you. 
When God speaks inside me, because, you know, spirit speaks to spirit. God doesn't speak outside you. That is where he is. He's in you. But when God speaks in me, I always say it out loud as though it were a prophecy. Well, God doesn't give prophecy to you to give to yourself. Okay, call it anything you want. But it starts in my brain. It's a thought. And I don't know about your mind, but I can become a great disbeliever in a hurry. But if I will say out loud what seems to be inspired, I now have thought it enough to put it in vocabulary. I've said it and I hear it. And I'm a teacher. I learned a long time ago, it's easier to get vocabulary to what the Spirit is saying at the time he is saying it than five days later when I'm trying to recall what the Lord said. If I'll say it, I've thought it, I've vocabulary it, I've heard it as I spoke it. So it, it strengthens me in it. It also teaches me how to talk to God because I'm hearing God talk to me. And some of the things God says uh, seem so elementary. I phoned my wife this morning, as I do usually when I'm on the road, morning and evening. And uh, in the process of talking, she says, well, honey, you know, this hearing from God is so sweet, but sometimes it's so simple. You don't know for sure it's God. But she said, Saturday, I just thought, you know, the, the woman that, that plays such and such an instrument in the orchestra at the church? I said, yeah. She said, she came to my mind when I was in prayer, and the Lord says she's in need. Fix up a box for her. So she said, I got a box out. My wife is very sensitive in the spirit realm. And she said, do you know what the Lord told me to put in it? A roll of toilet paper, some napkins, a fryer chicken. And she said, none of it really made good sense. She was really in need. There were other things that were necessary. But she said, I took it to her Sunday and just put it in her car and told her it was there. She said, she phoned me yesterday and said, oh, dear sister, you can't know what a testimony that was to my teenage girl. We've come to the end of our money for the month. We have needs. We needed a roll of toilet paper. We had no napkins in the house. My daughter had been saying for two days, I'm hungry for fried chicken. There's fried chicken. And I told her, God told Eleanor Cornwall to give us these things. She said, she's not going to walk up to you and say, well, I know you hear from God. She said, she sat there dumbfounded and sat down and says, you mean God really talks things like this? Yeah. God talks, people talk. One of the greatest confusions people have is they think God will talk theology. God never talks theology. Theology is the study of God, and God has never studied himself. God will talk to you about child raising. It's, just, it's amazing. When, when I'm packing, and I do an awful lot of it, my wife graciously leaves me totally alone. I can pack for a two-week trip like this in 20 minutes if she'll leave me alone. And when I have finished, I stand there and I say, oh, Holy Spirit, what have I forgotten? And usually, he'll nudge me. And often, I tell him he's wrong. Put, put in your swimming suit. God, I'm going to Canada. It's January. It's going to be 20 below zero. So I leave at home and find they have a heated pool. In the motor. But you know, it seems odd that God would talk about things like that until you realize he's trying to communicate to you. And when we learn to hear him in things that we call, quote, natural, then we begin to learn to hear him in things called spiritual. When I was building a church building years ago, acting as a contractor, one of the joys of being young is you don't know what you can't do. But I did have on my board the one builder in the church, and he was carrying the real weight of it. But when I started to allow my sister, who was my music director at that time, to preach, he became very hostile, and uh, he didn't believe women have any place in the pulpit. Wouldn't you know that he's married to a saint? Those kinds of guys really are. I guess that's the only way God hopes to get him through. But he, he became very obnoxious, and finally made the issue, it's you or me. And in a board meeting, threw his key on the floor and said, you put your key down and uh, resign or I'm through with the building program. I'll have nothing more to do with it. I said, you didn't hire me. You can't fire me. I'm sorry. 
I'm through, picked up his key, walked out, left his key and walked out. We were in a place in the building program, he informed us, that was beyond our sketches. We were building onto an old building. We had just torn out a section of the old building. We had nothing on paper. He said, it's in my mind. I'm the only person on the face of the earth that knows how to put this together, and you're going to lose everything. I'll stay and do it if you'll fire him. The board was gracious enough not to fire me, because I'm awfully hard to fire. And it left us stuck. I went around looking for somebody who would take over the building program. I couldn't find anyone that was in our limited budget. So I went to prayer. And I learned the voice of God by hearing God. I'd pray in the morning and get directions of what to do that evening running the cruise. He'd tell me how much material to order. It'd be the exact amount. There wouldn't be enough left over for a good fire in a fireplace. How many yards of concrete to order, how many pounds of nails. It seems so weird to me, but I'd be in there and this would come to my mind, I'd write it down, I'd go do it. Pretty soon I'd begin to believe it and trust it. We passed every inspection, never had to do anything over, and it amazed this man. He kept saying, who's showing you how to do this? Who's teaching you? I said, God, yeah, sure. But eventually he became a believer, repented, became part of us after the dedication, you would know. But I learned that you can hear from God. I was in the prayer room praying. The Lord said, order some gravel for your parking lot. It's a mess. I said, I know, Lord, but we really don't have the money for it. He said, order size, and he gave me the size, and order it now. You'll need X number of yards. So I went to the phone and told them, uh, we need sa 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 ta. Oh, Reverend Cornell, I'm sure you'd like to have it by Sunday, but We've had a flood down here, and it just washed our stockpile down. We have all of our equipment tied up, recovering what we can. It'll be late next week before we can do it. I said, fine. Hung up the phone. Went back to prayer. And in 20 minutes, there was a knock on the prayer room door. I opened it. Here stood the truck driver. Where do you want the gravel? I said, I didn't think it was supposed to be here yet. Yeah, he said, well, it just dawned on us. The size you ordered is the size we're scraping up. There's no sense putting a pile. We'll just give it here to you. So truckload after truckload until all that I had ordered was done. And the fellow says, well, one more truckload, we'll finish it, right? Here in the drive. I said, yep. And the spirit said, I didn't authorize that truckload. So I ran to chase the truck, jumped on the uh, running board, wrapped in the window, said, cancel that. I'm not authorized to go any farther than that. Oh, he says, Reverend Cornell, all of us in this district know you. You're an absolute dictator. Nobody authorizes your actions. You do what you think's right. One more truckload. And I, said, I said, no, sir, not one more truckload. Then I said, look at it. It was just the strip alongside the church where they would drive in to let out the passengers. Muddy, everything else was beautiful. I said, God, this doesn't make sense. Next morning, I'm in prayer. Rap, rap on prayer room door. And here's one of the older ladies in the church who used to have quite a ministry in God, but a series of circumstances had dragged her down. She was running a nursing home. She says, where did all that gravel come from? What's, what's, what's the, what, what, what? I said, what do you mean? What's your problem? Well, she says, yesterday the Lord told me to order a load of six yards of gravel, size such and such. And I've ordered it, and it'll be here in just a few minutes. Where's this gravel? I said, that's the exact amount we need to finish it. About that time or two. And it absolutely overwhelmed her. She says, I am hearing from God. This is real. And it renewed her faith. Does it seem crazy to you? Does God talk cubic yards of gravel? Sure. Sizes? Yes. When to order? Yeah. All through the building program. And out of that, I came to trust that inner voice of the Spirit. God is smarter than I knew he was.